What is up, Premier Planet? This is Danny Dixon here, and I'm continuing the series that Randy started on YouTube where we are talking about Italian-American wrestlers you should know. I'm very excited to do this episode, and I'm also very sad to do this episode because the man I'm going to talk about today is biased, my favorite professional wrestler of all time, and someone that I am still grieving the loss of very much. Today we are going to be discussing the legacy of Wyndham Rotunda, also known as Bray Wyatt, the man who arguably one of the best storytellers in professional wrestling history. And we are going to be diving deep into his career and some of the memorable moments and just essentially doing a tribute to him because he was someone who had a huge influence on both me as a professional wrestling trainee and me as a person growing up watching WWE programming. So I am extremely excited to be able to discuss how impactful he has been on my life and dive into his wrestling accomplishments because he did a lot while he was on this earth. So let's get into it, shall we? We are going to start by discussing how Bray Wyatt was a third generation wrestler. His father was IRS in the WWF and his grandfather was Blackjack Mulligan. He started out in WWE in Florida Championship Wrestling prior to being NXT. In FCW, he got a tag team with his brother, Bo Dallas, and they were a tag team. He had long blonde hair. Uh, I believe he used the name Duke Rotundo, and I believe Bo Dallas at the time was Taylor Rotundo, Taylor Rotunda, one of those two, and they were a tag team. Now, Bray Wyatt, his character, transitioned into a character named Husky Harris, and that character was on the second season, I believe the second season, second or third season, of the reality competition version of WWE NXT. His coach, or his pro, was Dashing Cody Rhodes, and it was kind of this duality where Cody Rhodes, he was like the pretty boy at the time. He would always look at himself in the mirror, and he would always make fun of Husky Harris for his weight. He was like overweight, and he kind of had like a big pot belly, and like he wanted Husky Harris to be dashing, all that good stuff. Go back and watch it. Um, it was a little interesting to see the reality TV aspects of NXT. A lot of the FCW guys weren't the biggest fan of it, but they wanted to be seen on more of a grand scheme, grand scheme, grand scale. So that's why they participated in NXT. It was an opportunity for them. So they took the most of what they were given and ran with it. And eventually it paid off for Husky Harris at the time because he was eventually called up to the main roster with Curtis Axel, then known as Michael McGillicuddy, and they joined the new Nexus stable when leadership was transitioning to CM Punk from Wade Barrett. And they had like an initiation where CM Punk whipped Husky Harris and all the new Nexus members with a belt, all that stuff. It was like their initiation to the Nexus. But more specifically, he ended up teaming a lot with Michael McGillicuddy, Curtis Axel, and they were arguably going against John Cena, and they had like a nice long-standing feud with John Cena, and then inevitably it was with Randy Orton, and Randy Orton feuded with CM Punk heading into WrestleMania 27, and during that storyline, Randy Orton punted Husky Harris in the head when the punt kick was like Randy Orton's devastating finisher. He brought it back a few years ago, but that was when Randy Orton was taking everybody out with the punt kick. And Husky Harris was one of the victims. Now, that was the beginning of the end for the new Nexus stable as they would eventually form the core. But Husky Harris was sent back down to developmental. And that's when... Husky Harris, Wyndham Rotunda's career took a drastic shift. So it was at that time where Florida Championship Wrestling was changing over into WWE NXT, although it was not the 
reality competition version of NXT. It was led by Dusty Rhodes. It had like a lot of the big names that were in FCW, like Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns at the time. He was Leoki, Leaky, something along those lines. Correct me if I'm wrong. Apologies for that. But they debuted a new character. And this new character was not alone. He was just someone who stood out to me from the very, very beginning. And this character came to be Bray Wyatt. And I remember this was pre-WWE Network watching NXT because I was a big fan of Seth Rollins. I thought Seth Rollins was so cool. And I just remember seeing these vignettes. And I was like, whoa, this is really, really different. And this is intriguing. I just remember it was like the woods and Bray Wyatt was standing there laughing maniacally. And he would like whisper into the camera. He would be like, hey, do you want to see something real scary? And I was just like enamored by this guy. I was like, whoa, this is so much different than anything we're seeing on the main roster. And keep in mind, this was like the time where our truth had Lil Jimmy and the Funkasaurus and all that stuff. It was a time where WWE was really trying to focus on getting kids involved in the program on the main roster, at least. So to see someone like Bray Wyatt... Right off the bat, I was like, whoa, this is different in the best way possible. This is what I want out of wrestling. He just hooked me from the get-go. And then at the end, it was... He had this, like, exit outro or whatever after his promo. And it would be... Well, now I know it was Eric Rowan who would wear the white sheep mask. But I just remember at the end of every, like, vignette, it would be, like, this little, like, scratch. It would be, like... And it would show like Eric Rowan's face. Sorry for those with headphones in. That probably was really loud. My bad. Um, but anyways, I digress. I just remember like, whoa, this is so cool. This is so different. And I just remember this, the Wyatt family forming. And it was Luke Harper, Eric Rowan. And these guys were like dirty, grimy. Luke Harper had a dirty tank top. Eric Rowan had like a prison outfit on, prison jumpsuit. And he had that sheep mask. And I was like, whoa, they're going to change the game. And the thing that really stood out to me from the get-go, well, obviously, was that they're different. And different is so refreshing when it comes to pro wrestling. You see so much copy and paste in the pro wrestling industry that someone like Bray Wyatt felt fresh. And I know there's all these talks about Bray Wyatt's original character being like a copy of Waylon Mercy from WWF. But keep in mind, that's such a niche audience. Not many people remember Waylon Mercy. So this, for many people, me included, was our first introduction to someone who had a character like this. And I was hooked, man. It was really compelling stuff. And eventually, the Wyatt family dominated NXT Luke Harper and Eric Rowan won the tag team titles and I remember Bray Wyatt got this singles match with Chris Jericho it was a time when NXT would have main roster talent come down work with the NXT regulars and Chris Jericho fought Bray Wyatt and I was like whoa this was so cool seeing Bray Wyatt like I just knew that this guy was going to be a big star and this guy was compelling and eventually it led to the Wyatt family pretty quickly, I might add, being called up to the main roster. And those vignettes also were very, very, very cool. I just remember the first night, Luke Harper was taking a reporter to the Wyatt family house. And I just remember Luke Harper had to duck under the door frames. And I was like, holy crap, this guy's humongous. And I just remember Bray Wyatt was like sitting there. I was like, this is so creepy. This is giving like horror movie vibes. But this is exactly what I needed in wrestling at that time where I was getting sick of the Funkasaurus. I was getting sick of Santino Morella's Cobra. I was getting sick of Lil Jimmy and all that stuff. And Saturday Morning Slam where it was like G-rated programming for kids. I wanted something fresh. And that's why the Wyatt family were so compelling to me. And the brains behind all that operation was Bray Wyatt. And I just remember them attacking Kane on their first night on the main roster. 
And that was crazy to me because Kane, notoriously big red monster, Kane has zero Fs given, Kane electrocutes Shane McMahon's testicles, Kane is like erratic and a monster. And to see him like brutalized and destroyed by two big guys and then Bray Wyatt would like kneel and like just grab Kane and take the finishing blow. I was like, whoa, these guys feel like hired guns and this guy's the brains behind the operation. This is so interesting. And at that time, WWE was really using their social media platforms. So they were utilizing Twitter and Twitter was becoming a huge part of Raw. It was becoming a huge part of SmackDown. They would show tweets and everything and the tweets would continue the storylines. So I was in middle school and I was just so engaged with WWE on social media. I wanted to, I wanted more of the Wyatt family. I wanted to know what they were going to do next. Bray Wyatt was like a notorious cryptic tweeter. He would always tweet like random phrases, puzzles, all that stuff. And you had to really read between the lines. And I thought just that was such cool stuff. Very fresh at the time. If you disagree with me, Fair enough. I understand how a lot of it could be interpreted as wash, rinse, repeat. But for me, it was that was a game changer. That really had me hooked on WWE. I already was at the time, but that was like, no, like I need this is much wash must watch programming for me. I need to see what is going to happen next with the Wyatt family. And some of his notorious feuds, Bray Wyatt's notorious feuds, are classics. People are still talking about them to this day. Obviously, the first one that comes to mind is his feud with John Cena, where leading up to WrestleMania 30, the Wyatt family would like stalk and just haunt John Cena in his wildest dreams. I remember there was a segment where John Cena was washing his hands, and as he looked up in the mirror, he saw Luke Harper's sheep mask looking at him in the mirror and it was just Bray Wyatt's mind games with John Cena that was so engaging and I just remember the promo package that they had with the Eminem song Legacy leading up to WrestleMania 30. I remember Bray Wyatt comparing John Cena to a Trojan horse. You just go and you go and you go and then someone tranquilizes the horse. It just had me engaged with what I was seeing And I remember at WrestleMania 30, the Wyatt family had that entrance with um, Mark Crozier, I believe his name is, the person who sings his original theme song, Broken Out in Love. They performed it live and they had the buzzard masks. And I was like, this is a big deal. This is a coming out moment for Bray Wyatt, someone who got punted in the head by Randy Orton a few years ago. And people probably thought that that was the end of this person in WWE. For him to reinvent himself and bounce back and have a crowd in New Orleans singing he's got the whole world in his hands, it gives me goosebumps just talking about it. That's how special Bray Wyatt was as an in-ring performer, as a character, as a creative mind and I just hope that that's a legacy that people remember I hope that's how people remember Bray Wyatt and another big feud that I wanted to talk about was his feud with Daniel Bryan and the mental mind games that he put Daniel Bryan through Daniel Bryan was red hot at the time and somehow Bray Wyatt convinced Daniel Bryan to join the Wyatt family And eventually, Daniel Bryan would turn on the Wyatt family, but it would eventually lead to Daniel Bryan's coming out party in WWE, some of his best years of his wrestling career, mainly in part due to that storyline, elevating him to that next level. And that's just the type of person Bray Wyatt was. You were just hooked by the words that he was saying. And a lot of people made fun of me because Bray Wyatt was notoriously the loser of all the feuds. He would always lose all the time. People would say, I don't know why you love this washed up Bray Wyatt. This guy's a hag. He just keeps losing. He can never win a match, yada, yada, yada. But as I get older, it's not necessarily about that. It's about how you get to that moment and how you engage the audience that you're trying to engage. And 
I was probably in that Target demo at the time of those storylines. And bias aside, I was pretty damn engaged in this programming. It had me wanting more. And that's exactly what WWE content should be. And a lot of people today are craving WWE content. That's why these shows are always like sold out when you go to WWE because people are craving more. And that's a true testament to how Bray Wyatt was perceived by a lot of these fans. Now, I want to also discuss a very classic feud that eventually will be brought back to, similar to John Cena and Randy Orton. Uh, Excuse me, John Cena and Daniel Bryan, that is. We are going to be discussing his feud with Randy Orton. And that feud was monumental because, again, Bray Wyatt was able to play mind games and convince Randy Orton to join the Wyatt family stable. And that led to Luke Harper, Bray Wyatt, and Randy Orton being like the new Wyatt family before they eventually added Braun Strowman. But the significance of that feud was that Randy Orton was essentially like a hired gun for Bray Wyatt. And it led to Bray Wyatt winning the WWE Championship at Elimination Chamber 2017. Arguably one of the best nights of my life because after years of being bullied by people at school saying, oh, Bray Wyatt can never win a match. When has Bray Wyatt ever had a championship? That was Bray Wyatt's kind of like, haha, screw you. I won a championship. And my first singles championship the WWE championship nonetheless it was just so cool such a cool moment and it was good to see that that storyline was able to utilize a championship as prestigious as the WWE championship now I wish Bray Wyatt held the championship longer but that's besides the point the historical significance of that feud was that it was revisited later on years later and we are going to be discussing that down the line but I just wanted to call that out and eventually Bray Wyatt again reinvented himself after the Wyatt family came back together albeit not with Randy Orton because Randy Orton turned on them they added Braun Strowman and that was another series of compelling stories because Bray Wyatt had Braun Strowman arguably the biggest member of the Wyatt family he was like 360 pounds at the time the black sheep of the Wyatt family and Bray Wyatt would just add more members of the family and every person felt relevant. It wasn't like, oh, one person's not as relevant. Everyone in the Wyatt family felt important at the time. And that was a testament to how Bray Wyatt was able to speak to his audience. I just remember one promo. It was, I believe, in the UK Bray Wyatt cut a promo where he was talking about a teacher that he grew up hating and the teacher said, you will never amount to anything. And Bray Wyatt, you could feel the passion in his voice when he was talking. I just remember one of his lines and he's like, well, Miss Teacher Lady, I'm telling you right now, I got the whole damn world in my hands. And then the crowd started singing. He's got the whole world in his hands in unison. And it gives me goosebumps because... That's how electric and how compelling of a talker he was. He had you hooked to the TV. And if you've never seen that promo before, I strongly suggest you check it out because that's arguably one of my favorite promos in pro wrestling history. Check it out. Just search Bray Wyatt Miss Teacher Lady promo. Now, this part of his career was another reinventing process and it was at this time where Bray Wyatt was feuding with Matt Hardy we're skipping forward a few years after the feud with Randy Orton Bray Wyatt feuded with Matt Hardy when Matt Hardy was woken Matt Hardy and they had like a final deletion match at the Hardy compound it was something that happened in TNA and then Matt Hardy brought it into the WWE but after that Matt Hardy was in the Andre the Giant Battle Royal At WrestleMania, I believe it was 34, and Bray Wyatt returned and helped Matt Hardy win, and he turned face for the first time in his career. And then Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt ended up being a tag team called the Deleters of Worlds. And I wanted to call that out specifically because it was just an example of how willing Bray Wyatt was to change his character, to meet, I guess, the demands of the audience, to freshen up and do something different. And it's very 
it's a testament to who he is as a person that he's willing to make those changes to stay relevant, you know, because in wrestling, notoriously, some people only have a certain amount of shelf life before it gets redundant, before it gets repetitive. Bray Wyatt was always one of those guys who was never afraid to change his character or to explore a new whole different mindset when it comes to the wrestling business. And I seriously respect him for that. Now, they would win tag team championships, Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt, the Raw Tag Team Championships. But not long after that, Bray Wyatt would take another hiatus, and we wouldn't see him until the year after. And the year after, we would get these teases, this Firefly Funhouse type ordeal in promo packages. And I was thinking to myself, what the heck is this? This is like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. This is giving me flashbacks of our truth little Jimmy, Funkasaurus. I was like, what incarnation is this? And when I found out that it was Bray Wyatt, and then at the end, Bray Wyatt basically was playing someone who was delusional in his own head, and he was trying to like he felt like someone who had PTSD because he he knew how much of a monster he was in the past, but he was trying to get rid of that side of him. But then when people test him, it would come out. Cause I remember at the end of his promos, he would look at the camera instead of smiling and cheesing and waving and saying, hi, bye. He would say, let me in. And it got real serious. And I'm like, holy crap, what the heck is this all about? And eventually it paid off. And I just remember Finn Balor had a match on Raw. The lights go out. I hear like some screeching noise. It was like, and the lights go on. Well, the lights keep flashing. And there's just a person that's standing behind Finn Balor with like dreadlocks and like a almost like a killer clown mask. And I'm like, what is this? And they say, that's the Fiend. That's Bray Wyatt. And I was, consider me hooked from the start. I thought this was just so fresh, so unique. And it was another instance where Bray Wyatt was not afraid to reinvent himself. And I really hope that people remember that. If you're listening to this podcast, the one big takeaway that I want you to understand and hopefully remember is that Bray Wyatt was never afraid to reinvent himself to stay relevant in pro wrestling and that's such an important skill set mindset to have in the wrestling business and the fiend many people will say that the fiend was their favorite work from Bray Wyatt and I wanted to call out some of the work that was involved in it and I also want to talk about this specific YouTube video It was before The Fiend ever was a thing. It was this YouTube video where Bray Wyatt's talking about the man in the woods. I believe it's still on YouTube. And years later, Bray Wyatt would release a tweet and he would talk about the man in the woods. And people put the pieces of the puzzle together to find out that Bray Wyatt was foreshadowing The Fiend. Because if you listen to what they say, Bray Wyatt would use the past tense. He would say him, him, him. He would be, he would be in the woods. He would do this, him. And everyone was like, who the heck is he talking about? Nobody really knows. And years later, it ended up being the fiend he was talking about. He was warning people about the fiend. And that was just so cool because not only is that good business wise, because if it gets you to go back and watch the old matches on Peacock, watch the old segments. But it's just a testament to how he would always connect the pieces of the puzzle together. And what was so cool about The Fiend was that his feuds had purpose. He would go after the people who hurt him in the past when he was just regular Bray Wyatt, cult leader Bray Wyatt. You know, Daniel Bryan was one of The Fiend's targets. Randy Orton was one of The Fiend's targets. John Cena was one of The Fiend's targets. Every single storyline pretty much that he had made sense to why the fiend was going after them even Seth Rollins because the shield and the Wyatt family were notorious feud against each other it was just very interesting and compelling programming 
So I wanted to call that out. His storytelling, willingness to change and adapt. And now The Fiend eventually had a rematch with Randy Orton at WrestleMania 37. And this was at a time where The Fiend was with Alexa Bliss. Again, another instance of Bray Wyatt not being afraid to change his character to stay fresh. And it ended up being Bray Wyatt's last match at the time in WWE because he was shockingly released in 2021, which blew my mind because a guy with such a creative mind like that, you would think that he would be a, a, like guaranteed a spot in WWE. And for many people, that was eye-opening. It's like, okay, nobody's really safe from their contract being cut, getting released. And for that year, Bray Wyatt... His status was in limbo. Nobody really knew what was happening with Bray Wyatt up until Extreme Rules 2022 where we keep seeing these QR codes with this white rabbit. Nobody really knows what's going on. People are scanning these QR codes, this white rabbit. It was had a lot of people engaged. Some people knew right off the bat that it was Bray Wyatt. Other people thought it was someone else. But it led to Bray Wyatt's return to the company with a different look. He had like a a septum piercing in his nose and he had like gauges. And that iteration of Bray Wyatt really was special because that was just Bray Wyatt himself being himself. You know, Bray Wyatt had dealt with the loss of Brody Lee, Luke Harper, and... Part of the reason why the Wyatt family was so successful was because of Luke Harper and Luke Harper being a part of it. Luke Harper and Bray Wyatt were best friends. And so Bray Wyatt thought he'd be doing himself a disservice by going back to the Wyatt family character. So instead, he reinvented himself again by just being himself. And we saw Bray Wyatt at his most vulnerable spot that we've ever seen him in. And it was just very, very compelling stuff. And he had a feud with L.A. Knight, who we now know is challenged at the time of this recording. That is challenging Roman Reigns for the Undisputed Universal Championship at Crown Jewel. L.A. Knight's going to be a household name in WWE. And he says that he thanks Bray Wyatt for putting his name on the map in WWE, being his first main roster feud. And that was just so special. You know, you never hear any horror stories about wrestlers working with Bray Wyatt they said he was a pleasure to work with and that's a true testament to who he is he truly cared you know Zelina Vega always talked about Bray Wyatt in a positive light how she talked to him and helped get Zelina Vega signed to WWE that just is the true heart of Wyndham Rotunda the person and when I tell you that I was absolutely devastated by the news of his passing literally I was in shock Because Bray Wyatt disappeared not long after his match with LA Knight. He was going to feud with Bobby Lashley at WrestleMania 39 and have a match at the pay-per-view. At the time, Bobby Lashley was feuding with Brock Lesnar and Bray Wyatt had a promo where he said he wants the winner. It didn't happen and Bray Wyatt was gone for a while. And a lot of people did not talk about the reason why he was gone, but... It was released after his tragic, tragic passing that Bray Wyatt actually had COVID and it sparked health conditions and eventually he passed away in his sleep in August of this year. And when I tell you that I was devastated, man, I was devastated. I couldn't believe the news. It was like when you feel your heart drop all the way down to your butt pretty much. And I ran to the bathroom and, you know... Everyone says tough guys don't cry, all that stuff. But I just was so overwhelmed with emotion that I just felt tears. Like I felt my face getting hot. Tears were like streaming down my face because everyone in wrestling has that one guy that they just gravitate towards. A lot of people, it's Shawn Michaels. A lot of people, it's Bret Hart. A lot of people, it's Hulk Hogan, John Cena, Undertaker. The list goes on. My guy was Bray Wyatt, hands down. I was a Bray Wyatt OG from the start and it was just really, 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 really upsetting and it made me feel numb that a guy 
who was reportedly returning to WWE soon and doing great just unexpectedly passes away like that at the age of 36 years old too. It just really puts things into perspective and it lets all of us know that not another day is guaranteed for any of us. So make sure you cherish your loved ones. Tell them that you love them because I don't know, man, like live, you live another day, but it's just very, 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 very sad. And his legacy lives on, in my opinion. I want Bray Wyatt to be remembered as someone who was selfless, but also willing to reinvent themselves and have the self-awareness and have the brains to stay relevant in a highly competitive wrestling industry. Watching Bray Wyatt was like watching a continuous horror movie in the best way possible. He was that engaging with his content And I just really, 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 really hope that his legacy lives on forever. You know, there's a rumor that next year's WWE 2K game will have a showcase dedicated to Bray Wyatt. And I feel like that's going to be so special and so emotional for so many of us because we're still dealing with that raw grief of someone who passes away who is on the active roster. I'm not taking away from any of the wrestling legends who pass away, but... There, it just hit different for so many different people and it's still in this weird phase where people are processing their emotions. So I just wanted to say thank you to Bray Wyatt. Without Bray Wyatt, I don't think that I would be a pro wrestling trainee. I don't think that I would want to do this because Bray Wyatt was inspiring towards me. You know, you don't have to look like John Cena to be successful in the wrestling industry. And Bray Wyatt was a true example of that. You could have a little bit of a pot belly on you. It's fine. As long as you stay relevant. And as long as you connect with the audience. That's what matters most. As long as you stay compelling. As long as you can tell a story. And I think Bray Wyatt was one of the best examples of that. I'm going to miss Bray Wyatt so much. I miss Wyndham Rotunda. I grieve for his family. It's just very, 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 very sad. And it's still really raw for me to process. I have a bracelet that I wear every day. When I had my matches in Premier Pro Wrestling, I wore the bracelet. It says, I love you, Bray Wyatt. Thank you, Windham Rotunda. Thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for inspiring many, many people connecting with people because he truly, truly cared about the wrestling business and he truly, truly cared about the people who are willing to give him the time of day. And I just want to remember him for Italian American Heritage Month and talk about how important his legacy is and will be for generations to come. Thank you, Windham Rotunda, and may you rest in peace.